So, hello and welcome to the Ratio Institute. Um, we, for you who are viewing online on Babbooser, welcome to Stockholm, Sweden. Um, we're going to be filming this, and that's why we all use mics, even though we don't have any sound system. Um, the Ratio Institute is uh, an independent Swedish research institute. We're focused mainly on the conditions for entrepreneurship, the conditions of enterprises, the laws, rules, um, the growth of enterprises, and we also talk about how we can achieve political change, a uh, change we can believe in. Um, today we're going to have a speech from Professor Dan Klein from the George Mason University, where he is head of the Smitho Smithian Political Economy Program. Um, and what's important for you to know, at least for you foreign viewers on Bambooser or YouTube or such, is that when Dan is talking about liberalism, he's talking about it in a Swedish sense of the word, uh, which is a more classical view on liberalism. So in comparison, you would say most people who call, call themselves true liberals in Sweden would in America be compared to, to libertarians in many ways, or left libertarians in other ways. So you could say this seminar is going to be about Dan Klein's new book, and uh, I welcome you to the stage and introduce a bit about yourself and more about your book. Uh, I, think, I think Carl said plenty about me, so I don't need to do that. I have prepared these remarks. I was told I have 30 minutes and I hope I land on schedule. I am grateful to the Ratio Institute for this opportunity to speak to you. For many years, I have been uh, benefited by the kindness of Ratio's leader, Niels Carlson, and other good friends here. I'm proud to be associated with Ratio and its intellectual outlook. I thank you for coming out this evening. There are many books published each year, too many to pay attention to. Today, I would like to help you decide whether my book deserves your further attention. And I will certainly understand if you don't think so. It aspires to speak in the tradition of Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek, but I like to think that it is more than a rehash of Smith and Hayek. It often challenges classical liberal thinking, and I think in ways that will interest, or I hope will interest people near the political center, or who lean more to the left or to conservatism. The book addresses a range of readers. So it's not just a rehash. What then does it add? What is new? I cannot point to one or two ideas as my contribution. In the concluding chapter, I describe a liberal outlook which I associate with Smith. This appealing outlook has certain features which since, t since Smith's time, however, have made it unpopular and even illegitimate. The book thus arrives at a statement of our predicament. The outlook expresses liberal sensibilities in a candid and responsible way, but it does not necessarily appeal to many of our associates and audiences. This predicament is really nothing new, those who are serious about a presumption of liberty have for centuries been coping with such difficulties. The sense of agony is found in Hayek's writings, for example. But are liberal economists pursuing the best means of coping with the predicament? The discourse of liberal economics is diverse. We are acquainted with such identifiers as Chicago economics, Austrian public choice, constitutional, the new institutional economics. The leading figures are artists who practice and develop an outlook, even if the only label they give it is their own name. We are guided by such leaders who together represent a menu of outlooks. Here I go to the conclusion of the book, chapter 15, in which the outlook I mention is introduced and called the S outlook, the S for Smith. Think of the outlook as a web of statements. At the center of the web are statements of central importance, and at the boundary is experience. 
We manage the web not according to some particular logic. Logic is respected, of course, but logic alone leaves our thinking vastly underdetermined. We manage the web with imagination and art. The central statement of the S outlook involves what I call the liberty principle, which says between two policy reforms, the one that rates higher in liberty is more desirable. Thus, according to the liberty principle, abolishing the minimum wage is more desirable than maintaining it. But the central statement of the S outlook is not the liberty principle. Rather, it is what I call the liberty maxim, which alters the statement by adding by and large. Thus, it says, by and large, between two policy reforms, the one that rates higher in liberty is more desirable. That is the central statement of this outlook. The by and large makes the statement refer to the entire web of statements, for it declares that the liberty principle holds for most of the policy choices out there. Again, this outlook has features that make it unacceptable to many, maybe to you. First, it puts liberty at center stage. It takes liberty seriously. But liberty is a matter of great taboo. Our talk of liberty makes plain that we live in a world of myriad contraventions of liberty, of policies, such as the minimum wage, that institutionalize the initiation of coercion. Most academics are not willing to talk plainly of liberty as this S outlook proposes. Second, the S outlook disdains the distinction between positive and normative. It is candid about its intention to construct the web so as to serve our purposes. It candidly carries a presumption of liberty, like the presumption of innocence, the presumption of liberty places the burden of proof on those who would contravene the principle. The S outlook is naturally and necessarily the expression of a liberal cause. Also, the central statement of the outlook is about what is desirable. Policy judgments are at the root of our formulations. They are not mere implications or analytical byproducts. They are our open concern argued in the responsible form of scholarship. Third, the central statements are by and large, not categorical or 100%, making a contrast to Ludwig von Mises's and Murray Rothbard's image of science, for example. Fourth, the central statement, the liberty maxim, refers to the desirable, and the outlook admits that the standards of desirability are like our standards for what is good in movies, music, and novels, loose, vague, and indeterminate, as Smith put it. In that sense, our sense of the desirable is aesthetic. We talk sensibly about what is good and bad in movies and music, but we would never pretend to have a precise and accurate movie excellence formula or algorithm. To use Smith's analogy, desirability cannot be reduced to a grammar. I imagine that some of these features strike you as dubious. Even more, the people who populate the university econ departments would find them dubious. Many of the modern notions of science work against the S outlook. Modern research exalts the idea of a progressive research program. It aims to epistemically conquer the cosmos. But the S outlook seems rather to be, like the Jedi, the guardian of certain verities. The S outlook does not so much aim to gratify the will to know, rather it develops learning to sustain its by and large statements and illustrate them in experience. It also engages challenges, especially by showing that the interventionist does not know enough to justify a contravention of the liberty principle. These tasks give much opportunity for scholarship and even expertise, but still the spirit and attitude differ from those of the progressive research program. So all that stuff is being admitted. Um, and in some sense, I think that's what uh, sort of the predicament a lot of this book comes to. But now I turn back to the first 14 chapters, first to knowledge, 
and then to coordination. Modern economics has flattened knowledge down to information. This has greatly impoverished thinking about knowledge and it has shortchanged the case for liberty. A story helps to make the point. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go on a camping trip. After a good dinner and a bottle of wine, they retire for the night and go to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes wakes up and nudges his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. I see millions and millions of stars, Holmes, replies Watson. And what do you deduce from that? Watson ponders for a moment. Well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are a small and ins insignificant part of the universe. What does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes is silent for a moment. Watson, you idiot, he says. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Modern economists think that they plumb the depths of knowledge when they speak of asymmetric in information. In the story, however, what matters is not asymmetric information. Holmes and Watson had the same information. What differ are their interpretations. Watson looks up at the starry sky and gives five interpretations. Even that is not enough, as Holmes brings a sixth. Someone has stolen our tent. The story is funny because of the asymmetry in interpretation. The humor lies not merely in the asymmetry between Holmes and Watson. There is another asymmetry at play. When we hear of Sherlock Holmes, we expect a tale of remarkable insight in his seeing something that is not obvious. But it turns out instead to be a story of Watson's failure to see something that should have been obvious, namely that the tongue was gone. We expect a story of Holmes' insight, we get a story of Watson's error. While modern economics flattens knowledge down to information, we see that knowledge entails not only information, but also interpretation and judgment. To ignore these is to presuppose that interpretation is singular and fixed. It is to presuppose symmetric interpretation. That indeed is what game theory and model building presuppose with the common knowledge assumption, which is quite explicit in those crafts. In information, it allows asymmetry. I do not see your cards, and you do not see mine, but it assumes symmetric interpretation. We both know that we do not see each other's cards, and we know that we know, and so on. And if interpretation is singular and fixed, then there is no matter of judging among interpretations. Judgment matters only if interpretations are multiple. Judgment is about what interpretations we act on. It is the action facet of knowledge. Now we know that a key to economic growth is the development of new valuable knowledge or discovery. Discovery is key. But as Don Johansson has shown, it is little treated in the econ textbooks and the treatment it does receive is flattened down to mere information. Discovery comes from search or investment in research and development, or perhaps from incoming stochastic bits of information. But what of the discoveries that come from new interpretations of the information at hand? Robinson Crusoe hunts fish um, with a spear. Then one day it occurs to him to make a net. What changed from the day before is not information, but interpretation. The same light bulb experience, as the comic books would show it, is told of in Somerset Maugham's short story, The Ver Verger, where a man sees profit opportunity in his failure to find a smoke. He didn't even know he was searching for such a thing, a profit opportunity. The experience is pervasive, intuitive, yet the discovery of this nature is eclipsed when knowledge is flattened down to information. 
So discovery comes in several kinds. The kind recognized by what I call flat talk e economics is important, um, but also important are the kinds involving new interpretations, including serendipity and entrepreneurial discovery. I explore how economic freedom conduces to all such discoveries. The economic case for freedom must then recognize the facets of knowledge beyond mere information. If knowledge is flattened down to information, then the case for freedom is shortchanged. Hayek, of course, I think knew this. He knew that knowledge was more than information. He was sensitive to the richness of knowledge. Uh, my book tries to spell out differences between Hayek and flat talk economics whether they be represented by market-oriented flat talkers like George Stigler or otherwise like Ken Arrow and Joseph Stiglitz. Hayek and his followers have used four D words to get at knowledge's richness. Dispersed, diffuse, decentralized, and divided. Those are good words, but none clearly challenge a presupposition of interpretational symmetry. Thus, I propose disjointed. I think the expression disjointed knowledge connotes more than a division or dispersal or diffusion or decentralization of information. Your knowledge and my knowledge are not merely divided like two separate pieces that form a joint, but are out of joint or disjointed. When we view the economy as a cosmos of disjointed knowledge, we see more plainly that the common knowledge assumption is often misleading. Sensity, sen sorry, sensitivity to the richness of knowledge brings an emphasis on entrepreneurship. I follow Israel Kirzner in interpreting entrepreneurship as the discovery of opportunity. However, I emphasize that the light bulb of entrepreneurial discovery requires that the opportunity be non-obvious. It is not entrepreneurship when one serendipitously stumbles upon obvious opportunity. I give some discussion to the contextuality of obviousness. Um, we draw the lines of obviousness contextually, much like how Adam Smith uses the word propriety to benchmark the separation of what is praiseworthy from what is blameworthy. When contextualized in the story of Holmes and Watson that you just heard, the benchmark for obvious was clear enough to make the story funny. Like the lines of propriety, the lines of obviousness depend on context. While I talk of entrepreneurship as discovery of non-obvious opportunity, entrepreneurship has received other formulations. Joseph Schumpeter emphasized creativity. Frank Knight emphasized the bearing of uncertainty. Mises, Rothbard, and others emphasize ownership. Ariel Klammer and Deirdre McCloskey emphasize the role of speech and see the entrepreneur as a rhetor or persuader. An ordinary language associates entrepreneurship with starting and running a business. An understanding of knowledge's richness helps us to see how these formulations go together. While risk, as with a dice, is a matter of settled interpretation, uncertainty is a matter of unsettled interpretation. When interpretation is unsettled, the leader or entrepreneur has a lot of explaining and persuading to do to get his associates to see the vision and cooperate. New businesses are new, they are creative, and hence forge new practices and new interpretations, and so on. All of the formulations of entrepreneurship, then, have their merits. My chief cause is the presumption of liberty, and for that cause, the most useful formulation is discovery of opportunity, I feel. But I don't mean to sort of dispute the other formulations. Anyway. Okay. If entrepreneurship is the discovery of non-obvious opportunity, the theoretical inverse would be the non-discovery of obvious opportunity, like Watson's failure to notice that the tent was gone. That we call error. It comes with regret. Not a word that gets a lot of play in economics. Error is the feeling that you did not do the right thing and that you should have known better. This may be distinguished from not doing things right. 
from making a mistake, which may lead to disappointment. Disappointment does not necessarily imply regret, and regret does not necessarily imply disappointment. To turn things around to the positive side, plan affirmation, as I call it, does not necessarily imply plan fulfillment, and plan fulfillment does not necessarily imply plan affirmation. The presumption of liberty is done more justice when we learn the subtleties of discovery and entrepreneurship, and indeed, the spirit of enterprise. But there is another way in which our appreciation of knowledge's richness serves the liberal cause. It helps us to deflate the hubris of interventionism, or what Hayek called the pretense of knowledge. When economists practice flat talk, they make it seem that more and better knowledge is merely an informational problem. They recognize the cost of search, but they presuppose knowledge of the boxes to search over. They fancy that the government is then in a position to manipulate incentives. Thus, flat talk flatters so-called experts as able to intervene beneficially. Such hubris goes with flattening knowledge down to information. I also suggest that flat talk flatters the ordinary person as fit to know what policies to favor and whom to vote for. Thus, as I see it, flat talk tends to go with social democratic sensibilities, as represented, for example, by Donald Whitman, who says democracy is efficient. I criticize Whitman in ways that parallel criticisms leveled by Brian Kaplan, my colleague at Mason. But my idiom is closer to Adam Smith, who spoke of the ordinary fellow, quote, being unfit to judge, even though he was fully informed. You might ask Smith, but if the fellow is fully informed, how can he be unfit to judge? Smith's answer is that, quote, his education and habits leave him unfit to judge. That is, his portfolio of interpretations and his judgment. The chief problem, then, is not a lack of information. In that, Brian Kaplan and I agree. Turning now to coordination. <laughs> I begin with roller skating at the roller rink where spontaneous order, as Hayek called it, happens before our very eyes. The patterns of skating by 100 individuals are coordinated. The coordination comes from a coincidence of interest. In promoting my interest in avoiding collision with you, I also promote your interest in avoiding collision with me. In the economy at large, we also find an elemental coincidence of interest. In promoting my interest in gaining in a voluntary exchange with you, I also promote your interest in gaining in a voluntary exchange with me. This coincidence of interest helps us understand the spontaneous coordination of the vast chains of economic activity, the vast concatenation of economic affairs. It also helps us see why spontaneous decision making may be the only method for such coordination. If a central planner were to attempt to direct activity, the concatenation would be less coordinated, whether it be skating at the rink or the workings of the economy. Even if he were smart and universally benevolent, the central planner would lack knowledge and powers of communication needed to achieve coordination. Adam Smith never used the word coordination. Only later did the word come into use. No, nonetheless, that is what concerned him. He began with the pin factory, where many workers are collected and, as Smith put it, quote, placed at once under the view of the spectator. Quote, one man draws out the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head, and so on. In the pin factory, the visible system activities is a concatenation. This is an important word for me. And we speak of the coordination of that concatenation. In this case, a pertinent standard is honest profit. The more profit the pin factory makes, the better coordinated is its concatenation. But a few paragraphs later, 
Smith takes us beyond the factory to the great skein of activities that produce a woolen coat. That skein is another concatenation, but now it is not under the view of any human spectator, and the standard for judging its coordination is much less definite. These intellectual difficulties did not stop him, however. A concatenation may be centrally directed, as at a pin factory, or spontaneous, as at the roller rink or in the free economy. Either way, we may speak of its coordination. Now, some of you have probably gone to university and taken courses in economics or game theory. You might be somewhat perplexed by this talk of coordination. Nowadays, when economists talk of coordination, they mean something different from concatenate coordination. They mean that you and I coordinate on meeting at the pub. They mean that we coordinate to focal signs, such as traffic lights. Nowadays, most economists mean by coordination what Thomas Schelling and game theory mean by coordination. It is a mutual meshing, wherein not only is what I do best for me, given what you are doing, but what you do is best for me, given what I am doing. This mutual coordination is important and valid, yet it is different from the concatenation, I'm sorry, the coordination of the concatenation, whether in the pin factory or the great skein. For example, if we meet at the pub, when in fact we would both prefer to meet at the theater, we have mutual coordination without concatenate coordination. In fact, the literature is full of inefficient coordination, equilibria inefficient conventions and lock-in. If you consult the dictionary and look up the verb to coordinate, you will find that there is a definition for the term as a transitive verb and another for the term as intransitive verb. The transitive verb is concatenate, coordination. The intransitive is mutual. Aaron Osborne and I showed that the term coordination first came into economics in the 1880s and the meaning was concatenate. There was very little talk of mutual coordination. That had to wait until shelling and game theory. Now it is the mutual sense that dominates, while talk of concatenate coordination is scarce. Why did coordination in the concatenate sense become scarce? I suppose partly because of the new attention to mutual coordination, but economists do not have to choose. They should, in fact, brace both coordinations. Rather, the chief factor in driving out concatenate coordination was talk of efficiency, optimality, and social welfare functions. These concepts seem to give desirability a more precise and accurate representation. I think that the precision and accuracy is actually just a false semblance. In fact, in most all important matters of political economy, standards for desirability are loose, vague, and indeterminate, again to use Smith's phrase. The term coordination, as used by Hayek and others, had all along better accommodated that looseness. The distinction between the two coordinations, mutual and concatenate, help us resolve some confusions. The distinction helps us see how planning can impair coordination and how competition may enhance it, and how entrepreneurial innovation can in one sense upset coordination while in another sense enhance coordination. Also, I use both coordinations to define cooperation. How many times have you heard someone who favors some government measure say he favors cooperation, not competition? Can liberals claim that free enterprise is a system of cooperation? If liberals are going to sell free enterprise as a system of cooperation, they shall have to embrace and declare allegory. The free enterprise system is a system of cooperation only in an allegorical sense. The spectator in the pin factory is human. The spectator of the great skein that produces a woolen coat is only allegorical. I call her the spectator of the great concaten worldwide intergenerational concatenation, Joy. 
She beholds the vast concatenation and assesses its coordination. We speculate on what joy feels about what she, and not us, see. Or considers Hayek's famous talk about the price system as a system of communication. The price of eggs communicates, in a literal sense, nothing more than yours for 18 crowns. Instead, Hayek's communication is allegorical. Prices and other market signals conduce to a system of behavior that is somewhat like that achieved within an allegory where joy communicates instructions to participants. The communication talk is allegorical, as is any talk of the free enterprise system as a system of cooperation. And is by applying our ideas about knowledge to the allegorical being joy as the agent in question that we speak of market error and correction. The expansion of border bookstores, which went bankrupt in 2011, was a market error chiefly because Joy would feel that she had erred if she had issued corresponding instructions. It is possible to have market error without any actual agent error. I suggest that liberals embrace and declare allegory. Doing so has many benefits, but I am out of time. My aspiration is to advance an outlook that bids fair to advance liberal economics in both the professional and public cultures. Being open about our, our liberal outlook and our rhetorical purposes. Um, by confessing the looseness that inheres in parts of our discourse. By weakening claims from 100% to by and large, a focus on liberty becomes more robust and more satisfying. In fact, I think that many liberal social scientists, including many at the Ratio Institute, to a good extent already embrace and practice this outlook, if only tacitly. In that case, I merely articulate things already tacitly known. Thank you for your attention.